Welcome to our first virtual seminar of 2024. Uh, I'm Trinity Simons-Wagner, the Executive Director of the Mayor's Institute on City Design. Um, we're very excited to be bringing this content uh, in this format to more mayors and more city staff. Um, we know that that mental health of your residents, your city workers, um, even, even yourselves as mayors is top of mind. Um, right now. And when we did this panel at the U.S. Conference of Mayors meeting in January, we had more and more and more um, requested. So we're very excited to be bringing this um, to you today. Uh, I'm not here to set this up, though. Um, I would love to turn this over to my colleague, Grace Oran, our program director uh, at the Institute, who's doing a wonderful job of overseeing uh, all of our virtual initiatives at the Mayors Institute. Grace. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're so glad to have you all with us today for our virtual seminar on arts, urban design, and mental health. Um, I wanna just give you all a quick agenda of our hour here. We'll do some brief welcomes and introductions, and I'll turn it over to our two fantastic speakers who will each present for about 15 minutes, and the rest of our hour will be spent in open discussion among the mayors and city staff who are here today. Um, I'll note that this is meant to be super interactive. So uh, it's only mayors and city staff here in the Zoom room. Uh, so we ask that if you'd like, you can say hello in the chat and say your um, your name, your city and your role. Um, so our speakers can uh, can adapt a little bit to that in our conversation today. Um, again, my name is Grace Oran. I'm the program director here at the Mayor's Institute on City Design, which is a leadership of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with the United States Conference of Mayors. And our mission is to help mayors lead with design. We believe in the power of city design to transform communities. And to that end, we offer a number of collaborative learning programs and resources to educate mayors to be the chief urban designer of their city. Um, as many of you know, typically at MICD, we host very small institute sessions uh, where mayors from around the country bring a case study project from their city and receive candid feedback from a group of design experts. So we've expanded our programming in the last few years, but we'll really bring that original small group candid spirit to today's virtual seminar. Um, and again, I'll note that it's only other mayors and city staff here in the Zoom room, so we encourage you to, to be candid with your questions and comments. Um, and we will make the presentations available publicly after the event, but we will never make the discussion portion of the seminar uh, available publicly. So we're here today to talk about uh, to talk about mental health and the role that the arts and urban design can play in addressing the challenges facing our cities today. You know, we all know a mental health crisis is playing out all around the country. And that was a thread that came up over and over at the U.S. Conference of Mayors winter meeting last month. As Trinity mentioned, we're so happy to be welcoming back two of our speakers from a really great discussion we had at that meeting, Dr. Tasha Golden and Dr. Erica Atland. I'll introduce them both more thoroughly in a moment. Um, but today they'll be diving into how the built environment affects our well-being. And that's everything, all the, you know, human-made physical parts of where we live, work, and play, our homes, our buildings, our streets, our infrastructure, our parks, and their design is not neutral. They can all contribute to isolating us or to bringing us together. So mayors and staff, we hope you'll walk away today with a better understanding of how arts and design can be key partners in addressing the mental health challenges facing your cities and a more holistic view of public health and well-being that really puts the human experience at the center. So before we dive into that, I want to uh, introduce a special guest who's here with us today from the National Endowment for the Arts, Maya Herring. Um, she is the Our Town Specialist in the Design and Creative Placemaking Division, where MICD is one of their leadership initiatives. She also oversees the Our Town Grant Program, which is a great opportunity for funding the types of projects we'll be talking about today. And her team is a fantastic resource for you all going forward. Welcome, Maya. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Grace and Trinity and um, our speakers, Dr. Golden and Dr. Etland. Um, again, as Grace mentioned, my name is Maya Herring. I'm the Our Town Specialist with the NEA, and I'm here on behalf of our chair, Chair Jackson, and uh, the D Director of Design and Creative Placemaking, Ben Stone. Um, and just want to reiterate how grateful we are at the National Endowment for the Arts to have this partnership with the Mayor's Institute on City Design and to be in partnership with all of you mayors, um, taking these opportunities to think about 
leading with design in your cities and the wit the role that you play a very special role um, as mayors and as the um, chief urban designer potentially of your cities. Um, so just a few moments to talk about our town, which is the grant opportunity that I oversee, which is really born out of this relationship with MICD um, and is about creative placemaking with a partnership between a local government entity and a 501c3 nonprofit organization um, and, and other community partners for strengthening those communities through physical or social or economic outcomes, ultimately laying the groundwork for long-term systems change where artists and cultural bearers are resourced and designers are resourced throughout the community development process. So our town's an annual opportunity. We offer one-to-one -one matching um, grants with from $25,000 all the way up to $150,000. Um, and our new guidelines will come out in May with an application that's due in early August. So um, please, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can always reach us at ot at arts.gov. Um, and visit the NEA's website for more information about that opportunity or any others. But now um, let's jump into this wonderful content. So pleased to be here with you all today. Thanks so much. Thank you, Maya. Um, so we have, again, two incredible presenters with us here today. First, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Tasha Golden, who is the Director of Research at the International Arts and Minds Lab at Johns Hopkins University. Tasha is a singer-songwriter turned public health scientist who helps leaders think more creatively about all sorts of challenges and opportunities. She's published extensively on the well-being impacts of creativity in the arts and serves as an advisor on health initiatives around the globe. I'm so excited to, to have her back to share her creative and important work with you all today. Uh, so welcome, Tasha. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. I've been so looking forward to seeing you all, and I'm going to um, promptly share my screen here. Can you give me a nod, Erica or Grace, if you can see this? Okay. You look great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I'm going to jump right into a question. And if you all wouldn't mind dropping your answers into the chat, here it is. Just assuming it's more than the absence of suffering, how would you define well being? So a few words, a sentence, but if you can. Just, you know, what comes to mind for you, assuming it's more than the absence of suffering, what is this concept or term that we call well-being? And while you all are thinking about that and maybe typing that in the chat, um, like Grace said, I'm Tasha Golden. I hope leaders apply the science of creativity and well-being to uh, drive change. And I direct research for the International Arts and Mind Lab. But when I started my career, I would have never imagined that I would be in a STEM field or helping people innovate around addressing mental health. I toured as a singer songwriter, as she mentioned, for a lot of years with songs and TV and film. That's the job I dreamt of doing since I was a little girl. It's the only job I'd ever wanted. I thought I'd be doing it till I died. <laughs> um, but here's, here's basically what happened. I wrote a song that literally changed the trajectory of my career and my life and led me to the research and consulting work that I do now and to being here with you all. Um, since I was a young girl, I've written songs as a way to process and share experiences that I couldn't talk about or emotionally navigate otherwise. And um, one night well into my career, I was sitting alone at a piano in this massive dark venue. And I decided to finally write about my family's history of domestic violence. In the moment, what I was struggling with was the fact that so many women in my family lived with this kind of haunted fear that what had happened to them was their fault. And that fear was so unfair and so painful. So the chorus of the song that I wrote that night just said, you did, you did, you did everything right. You did, you did. You did everything right. I didn't think that I would play that song for anyone. But a few weeks later, I played it at a concert. And afterwards, that is the song that everyone lined up wanting to talk about. They said things like, that's my story too. Or I needed that message too. Or I thought it was my fault too. 
So I made a commitment that night that I would play that song at every show from then on. And as a result, over the years, hundreds of people have stayed after shows sharing with me really personal stories about mental illness, about suicide ideation, about abuse, many of them following up their stories by saying that I'm the first person they had ever told. And think about that. If I'm the first person they had ever told, that means they had never told a doctor or a therapist, not even a spouse or a partner, it means that the community services that are designed to meet the needs of individuals with these kinds of histories had clearly never reached these folks, right? So what was it about you know, a music venue or about a song, a singer, that made these stories speakable for the first time? And if you dig into that question, you wind up with this one. What do we not know about so many populations and experiences because people cannot or will not share about those experiences in the ways that we tend to expect or demand of them. That same question came up when I founded Project Uncaged. This is a trauma-informed creative writing program for girls that are incarcerated. And it probably won't surprise you all to hear that girls share really different information in their poems and their songs than they ever share in questionnaires or surveys or even in conversations sitting around a table. So again, what do we not know about young people, including youth in our juvenile justice system? Because we tend to ask questions in incredibly limited ways. I went from music to a PhD in public health sciences because I needed to get answers to these questions. And I'm here with you all because what I've discovered when it comes to arts impacts on what we know and how we heal, all of that has practical applications for each of you in your work to address mental health in your communities. And those applications start with just recognizing that arts and culture are more and they do more than we tend to think. Even when people already recognize that maybe arts and culture can help mental health, the way they tend to think about it is kind of small, which means that we're missing out on a ton of potential benefits from the arts and we're leaving a lot of great tools on the table in our work to address mental health. So to get us today thinking a little bit bigger, we can check out the definition of health itself. You know, over 75 years ago, the WHO said that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. In other words, health isn't just about what's absent. It's also about what's present, what's here. Do I have complete well-being? And what the heck is well-being? That's what I asked you at the beginning, right? Assuming it's more than the absence of suffering, what is this? I get to ask this question all over the world, and what I love about it is how quickly the answers show us that well-being is not just about, am I not in pain? Am I not sick? Do I not have a diagnosis? Am I not depressed or anxious, right? It's not just about what's absent. Leaders have told me that well-being is feeling connection and belonging, being able to pursue interests, knowing that you'll have support when you need it having hope for the future, contributing to a greater good, having a sense of meaning and purpose, being creative and active, being able to experience beauty. That's well-being. It's a part of it, just a few answers, right? And notice how much of this falls under the general umbrella, not of healthcare, but of arts and culture. And notice too, how many of these concepts of well-being have a lot to do with mental health in particular. Obviously, if we want to address mental health in our communities, that work is going to begin with asking, what is it that humans need in order to be well? And as we just saw, those needs fundamentally include arts and culture. We mentioned that health isn't just the absence of what we don't want, right? It's also what's here. And of course, that's not new to city leaders. You all know about the social determinants of health. They're also called the social drivers of health. You know that our zip code can determine our life expectancy. So obviously what's present in a community and what's not, that matters greatly to our health. Like at the annual meeting in DC, we heard from mayors who are addressing issues like gun violence by addressing social drivers or the root causes of that problem like poverty, disinvestment, lack of opportunity, lack of relationships. For youth, we were hearing from mayors who were providing more safe gathering spaces for young people, more employment and learning opportunities, access to the arts, whether that be gaming or maker spaces, concerts, creative expression, and they are seeing real results in their communities. And here's a twist that I want to highlight, though, when it comes to social drivers. Addressing root causes and social determinants of health 
that can prevent what we don't want, prevent mental illness, prevent violence, prevent chronic disease, early death. All of that is so important. And a critical reason why this larger approach works is that addressing drivers of health makes us think about that presence aspect of health. What's here? What kind of community or lived reality do people have to have in order to be able to be healthy, in order to be able to thrive? How do we design communities where well-being is more possible for more people? So like the definition states, health isn't just the absence of disease, it's the presence of well-being. And this fact just right here can inform and ignite your vision for your community. Because here's the thing, when we design cities with absence at the helm, like leading with what do we want to prevent or treat or fix, we get one kind of result. But when we design cities with presence at the helm, how will we design places where humans can thrive? We get another better result. Because when we design for the presence of well being, that obviously entails improving our prevention and treatment, our ability to address suffering. So the absence part of health gets taken care of in this approach. But we also know that thriving and quality of life is protective against all kinds of health challenges. It also bolsters treatment and recovery. And you get more because when we shift our lens from absence to presence, when we ask, what would it mean for everyone in my community to have access to well being? We start noticing resources and assets that we can plug in right away that we've maybe downplayed and underutilized before, like arts and culture. So to help leaders actually apply the arts to address mental health, it's not just a cool idea, it's something that we can actually do hands-on, right? I've developed a four-part framework that's grounded in research that I'll run through really quickly with you all today. You can also get, if you want, a version of this on my website. Um, there's actually today, tashagolden.com slash M-I-C-D. I just tried to make it really easy for you because I'm going to mention a few free things that I want to make sure you guys get. So you can also get that here. But the first pillar that you see here is direct health benefits. And generally, when people hear that I research arts and health, or especially arts and mental health, the first thing they usually think of is art therapy or music therapy. Or a lot of people think about how they themselves might use music or dancing to kind of like um, de-stress or get motivated, right? What a lot of people don't know is how much science there is behind the significant measurable effects of the arts on our brains and bodies and relationships, right? And given the mental health crises that we're facing, the truth is that we just can't afford to sleep on proven benefits that are right in our community, including those that come from arts and culture and nature. So we have to ask this question, what health resources are right here in my community that I'm not seeing and applying as health resources. How can I pull them into this work? How can I apply them and make sure that I'm not missing out on tools that are right here at my disposal? Here's just one example of that how. How do I pull arts and culture into this work of mental health? Last year, I led the development of this groundbreaking resource, Arts and Prescription, a field guide for U.S. communities. It describes how communities, how a community's arts, culture, and nature assets can enhance mental health care, like wrapped up and integrated into your healthcare systems. It also lays out a blueprint for launching these kinds of programs in your region. We've seen profound benefits in our pilot programs across the states, not only for patients and clients and students who are participating in it, but also for the healthcare providers themselves. So please be sure to screen grab this, download it. It's also again at tashagolden.com slash MICD. It's one of the things that you can get there. Again, arts and prescription is just one way to actively apply what we know about arts benefits for mental health. And a really big takeaway from it is that we can and must get innovative about how we use these powerful existing resources that are in our communities. Happy to chat more about, about any of this or arts and prescription. The second pillar, awareness and education. We know, right? Stories and compelling visuals are more memorable, more shareable than just like statistics and typical talking points. So when we tap into the creative assets in our communities, like partnering with artists and arts organizations to develop our messaging, we get far better messaging and better education. And the messenger matters here too, because artists and arts organizations are often in tune with their community. They have the trust and ear of their community. They're able to speak with and to and from the community, right? And that matters so much with mental health. And we know that the arts can help make topics like mental health more talk aboutable. We need media and platforms that reduce stigma and just make it as easy as possible for people to get the information and the care that they need. The third pillar, sociopolitical change. 
Your work in mental health requires being able to change hearts and minds, change policies, motivate collective action ultimately, right? This is the wheelhouse of the arts. Artists have always been at the forefront of social movements because they can convene people and motivate and sustain collective work. And this continues to be an underused resource for igniting civic engagement and public interest. If you, you know, if you're sitting here today and you're like, I'm not sure how to collaborate with local artists for sociopolitical change or for things that we're trying to do at the city level, go ahead and meet with some creatives in the community and start a conversation. Because imagining and ideating on this kind of thing is literally the job of artists, but they can't help if they're not at the table. And to help you um, kind of get started with this, if you want it, another free resource I want to make sure that you get, Creating Healthy Communities is a guide to literally creating partnerships between city health initiatives and local community artists and arts programs. So again, tashagolden.com slash MICD, tried to make it a one-stop shop. This is full of how-tos and model stories, so please do, please do grab it. And the last pillar, improved data. This is what I opened with today. I asked, what do we not know because of the limited ways that we expect to hear from people? I could tell you all about mental health studies where what we learned from people's creative writing was absolutely critical to our ability to adequately and appropriately help them. And that same information was completely missed by the surveys that were administered in the same study. The truth is that we learn more and different things from the arts than we can learn from traditional methods, including actionable data, especially when it comes to sensitive topics like mental health. So I would turn this back to you all in your cities, in your communities, whatever the work is that you're doing, what do you not know about the people that you serve that you could learn if we tapped into creative expression? What solutions might be out there ready to emerge if we had more ways to hear them? to elicit them. Arts and culture are science-backed tools for addressing mental health, and they are probably going underutilized and untapped in your community right now for this purpose. Health is not just about what's absent, what do we wanna fix, reduce, prevent. It's also what's here and how will we create communities where we can all be well. Thank you all. I will turn it back over to Ms. Grace. Thank you so much, Tasha. That was fantastic. And I know there's a number of, um, you know, arts and culture directors that that type of um, city position in the room with here with us here today. And uh, I can just hear them virtually snapping their fingers when you're talking about getting <laughs> artists to the to the table. Um, thank you so much. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Dr. Erica Etland, who's our next speaker. And then um, after her presentation, we'll have more of an open discussion, but feel free to drop things into the chat or the Q&A as you think of them, and we'll, we'll get to them after this next presentation. Um, so Dr. Erica Etland, we're thrilled to welcome you back. Uh, she is the co-director of the Human Experience Lab at Architecture and Design firm Perkins and Will. She's a passionate researcher dedicated to understanding how the built environment influences human health, in particular in schools, affordable housing, and in cities. Um, and we're honored to have her back to share some projects that are really putting these ideals of well being into practice in creative ways. Welcome, Erica. Thanks so much, Grace. And I don't know about all of you, but I have heard Tasha present and sing before. And I still got all like choked up and like goosebumps. So I hope you shared that with me because I think that's so powerful of what art does even in this virtual setting. So thank you, Tasha. Thank you, Grace and just Mayor's Institute on City Design. Um, I am really excited to be here because, you know, not only do I get to lead really interesting research and that's sort of my, what wakes me up in the morning, but is also this opportunity to just really acknowledge that I am the first and only public health scientist to have a leadership role within the design industry. So that means that although some of this is gonna feel like common sense to you today, we still have work to do people and we need your leadership to make sure that this is, you know, really we're shifting the model here. So I kind of wanted to start with just what is healthy design um, from sort of my public health perspective, because this is where Tasha and I, you do not want to hear me sing, is coming from different perspectives. And so the first piece is, is that when I was completing my PhD at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, we had taken this time to identify what did a healthy building really mean. And so we dove into 30 years of evidence and came up with these sort of nine foundations of a healthy building. And so these are things that are really familiar to us, especially after the pandemic, of thinking about ventilation, access to lighting and views, water quality, temperature, thermal health. 
And yet, what's so funny about this time in my life is that I would say it was a period of deep depression and anxiety and stress. And I would go to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, just, you know, blocks away from the medical campus and sit there. And that was my place of refuge. And I promise you, I never thought, despite how much time I was spending at, oh, these nine foundations, they really are making me feel better. I'm healing. But really, those physiological and psychological impacts of biophilic design, of access to nature, especially when you're in Boston and it's cold, you know, good air quality, thermal comfort, those were things that were directly impacting me. And so after my PhD, it was really an opportunity to say, okay, well, how does design become this public health intervention that we all deeply care about? And that when we're trying to shape communities, physical, social, and mental well-being, how do we get our designers on our team to do this work? So healthy design is first personal. Second, healthy design is also well-documented. And so this idea that we're sharing with all of you is actually not new. You know, since 1854 and these Nightingale Awards, we saw that we had Florence Nightingale pioneering how we're using data and mathematics to improve hospital and health conditions in the UK. And some of these features are exactly the same things that resonated with me when I was in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. So when we're in these opportunities, we have to really understand that our built environment can be a part of our city's sort of proactive preventative health care that is affecting all of us, especially when it comes to mental health. So the next piece is, I believe that healthy design, if it is to be effective, it has to be integral. And if we wanna support true health outcomes, then the design process has to make sure it's at the table. And so I'm gonna give a metaphor, if health is butter, and no one has ever said that ever, but stick with me, that when we are applying that butter to toast, you know, that's, that's just application. It's a, an opportunity for us to apply health as an afterthought once the idea is baked. But I think there's something in very different and a lot more joyful, which is if we were to integrate that butter into the three layers of Funfetti cake and the buttercream frosting, that is something that is protected from value engineering and budget constraints later on. So this is this moment that we have where we together can start to say, okay, well, what, what looks more appetizing? And depending on who you are, you might have a different answer, but I promise that the Funfetti cake is more joyful. And, you know, as I'm here making cake metaphors, I also want to call out sort of this idea of absence that, you know, Tasha brought up so strongly, which is that if we have unhealthy design, it is consequential. And I would say that, you know, even if we look at our red line communities, we see the data tells us that life expectancy is four years lower in those red line communities than those that weren't. And so this is a decision that was made 100 years ago. And so to me, the weight of our decisions has lasting impacts. It's not enough for us to sort of acknowledge, oh, you know, our zip code determines our health and our life expectancy. But actually, it's more important to say, how are we going to do something about that? How do we know where we need to target our efforts and our energies? And so is design a part of our restorative environmental justice efforts? So if health can be personal, evidence-based, and integral to the design process, we have a chance to really make a difference. And I would say you as mayors and the staff are like, okay, you know, health decisions, that's beyond me and that's a different team. But every day we are making health decisions. We are making them through our policies, through our remediation efforts, through opportunities of what do we invest in in our design. When we talk about net zero buildings and energy efficiency, that is also a health decision. It is about how we are optimizing. So for all of you to just kind of feel empowered that you are here to make these health decisions with us, uh, I want to start with that. So how do we pull this off? How are we going to ensure that health is in our process? And I would love for us to just kind of start with a very simplified timeline. So let's just start with pursuit. So from the moment you request a proposal for design projects in your city, you can embed health priorities, demanding expertise and analysis that may directly impact the occupants of that space or the surrounding community. So that's part one. Second, it brings us to visioning. So that's our opportunity to ensure that those end users who are going to occupy that space, your communities who are telling you what they need, they need to be integrated into this early part of the process and not just the decision makers who you think should be there. And this comes with sort of an important caveat here, which is 
you need to make sure the money is there. You need to make sure the focus is there because we have to be offering time, childcare, meals, especially when we're trying to meet those really constrained individuals who don't have that capacity. And yet their voice, they have the most to gain from this project. So that's something to just consider. And then we get to design. And so design is your chance of this public health intervention that we're talking about. And if we revisit these health priorities that we've started to establish, this becomes our rubric to ensure that those goals are met when we actually occupy that space. And then lastly, just post-design. You know, we need to be evaluating our spaces. We don't typically do that. And so in design, we call it post-occupancy evaluations. But these assessments allow us to understand what worked, what didn't. And so I really want to make sure that there's some understanding that who's going to measure your spaces. These are huge investments for your community. And so ensuring that it's actually meeting those health goals is really an important process as well. So. Remember, we're talking integration, not application. And so I want us to think about those early steps. How are we gonna make sure we're embedding health into this design process early? And so I want us to just focus on sort of the pursuit and visioning side here. And so there's lots of tools actually available to designers and it might just require some pushing again through that kind of request from all of you. And so what is the state of the literature? What do we need to know? What's the analysis of the data that they've done to help inform those decisions? You know, being able to get to some of what Tasha is saying, what are those pieces of community art that are available for us to acknowledge? But also when we're thinking about our interiors, what are those, you know, indoor environmental quality monitoring of the existing condition? What are some of those health ramifications we need to be considering? Then there's things that are much more qualitative, our surveys, our interviews, being able to collect that lived experience of what's happening on the ground. And so with that, we get to create these health priorities together that you know, are robust and holistic, but are also responding to that historical context and ensuring that we are doing the proper work to ensure that our buildings are functioning as promised. So, I mean, it's no surprise that Tasha and I are beating the same drum here, which is that we both feel that the research has to be embedded into your projects and budgets. And so when I say this, it's that when we're discussing this intersection of mental health, arts and design, we have to be responding to the latest literature. You know, we're thinking about sort of the societal stigma around mental health, but the research, the research funding and key findings, they are exponentially growing and these need to be embedded. And there's so many different ways that we can integrate that type of research and science here. But I do think it's if we are going to solve and respond to this crisis now, we can't wait for us to change sort of the status quo of how we view mental health. We need to be directed. We need to be able to support that research being embedded in a part of this. And so... To me, that is actually what my role is. So when we talk about the Human Experience Lab, it's about how are we taking some of these different types of research and democratizing them so that any firm, anybody in this country can start to access things that are at this intersection of health and design. And so the first piece is called Proceed. So this is the public repository to engage community and enhance design equity. And it's the first geospatial tool tailored for designers specifically. So this is an opportunity for you to type in your address and embed those health, embed health into your process. So what it means is that, okay, we're looking at all the data from EPA, census, CDC, what do we need to know? What does it, it look like compared to some of the communities around you? What's the demographics of this community? And yet, again, especially with these topics around mental health and things around disability inclusion, we know we're not going to capture the full story. And so it was important to our team to include this engagement and validation guide that data tells us maybe a kernel of the truth. But by having these mixed methods and bringing in other people, this is our opportunity to have a more holistic conversation. The next piece is that during the pandemic, we were really, all of us were focused on indoor air quality, that absence of disease and sort of risk mitigating. But what we learned by working with affordable housing residents across the country was actually how important it is to have a holistic conversation where we're not only sort of thinking about air quality, but promoting well-being and integrating into community. How are we supporting our senior housing residents who just want to have 
connection to other people. We're thinking about how we're going to destigmatize the inclusion of supportive housing into our larger cities, and yet also encouraging passive house standards for better resident health and well-being. And so this is a great resource that's kind of pulling together the 101 on um, both the health for the designers, but also what are those kind of key policies and places through these case studies that we've learned. And then just to kind of tie up from the resource side is just, I really believe every space can be a healthy place. I don't think this is a stretch. And so for us, you know, my PhD was mostly focused on healthy K-12 schools. And so we developed a research called Healthy K-12 by Design. And we were looking at 10 spaces across an entire school facility and thinking about what does the literature tell us when we apply this lens of educational adaptation, risk mitigation, and health promotion. And so what you'll see is that in these documents that there are tools that are there in terms of strategies, other resources, we are not here to reinvent the wheel, but also what's the underlying research? Why is this important? Why should we be focused on it? And so it's an opportunity for us to consider this together. So before I wrap up, I know we have, we have juicy conversation to get to. I wanna share just a quick example of a firehouse and why I think this is an incredible opportunity for us to be thinking about how do we design for mental health as well as physical health simultaneously. And as a public health scientist who's focused on environments, I am well aware of sort of the cancer risk. But when I saw this report that more firefighters died by suicide than in being in the line of duty, this really stopped me because this is something that, you know, for me, the most important thing is getting rid of carcinogens. But this is where mental health and this holistic perspective has to come together. And so how are we going to optimize the environment when we're thinking across the entire sort of experience of a firefighter? And we, when we were at the U.S. Conference of Mayors, there was a lot of focus on police officers, police departments. But what's special about firehouses is these are where people are eating, sleeping, and doing their job simultaneously, and yet bringing back harmful chemicals from these job sites that are then being carried throughout this entire space where they're spending large parts of their life. And so for us, under each one of these categories, it became really clear of being able to do that research and identify with our city, what, what are we gonna do? And so when it came to air quality, thinking about things like disease transmission, as well as those chemicals and carcinogens. When it came to sleep, they have, firefighters have the craziest sleep hours. And so how are we gonna make sure that they are only waking up when they need to? Because the literature suggests that they are actually running from sleep deprivation based on how bad their conditions. These many of our uh, firehouses are 60 plus years old. And so therefore it's this chance to think reinvest in these spaces, but also through their trauma that they experience on the job, we see that they also have an experience of being hypervigilant and wanting to respond to every noise and be ready to go, which is putting chronic stress on their body. And through these conversations, both you know, in terms of leadership as well as the firefighters themselves, the significance of mental health and where do we have these conversations and what types of conversations and who wants to be there becomes really important especially in these urban contexts that we're working within. And then lastly, light. These are things that are gonna wake them up and yet are important drivers of their sleep schedule. And so how are we gonna make sure that we're giving them control as well as support within the various spaces of their firehouse? And I wanna pause for a quick second because I think one thing that's really been striking on work, doing this work with the city was the fact that we see that there's so few women firefighters. And yet when we think about this impact of chemicals and sleep and nature and mental health, we found that 22% of pregnancies among women firefighters ended in miscarriage. And this is two times the levels that we're seeing in nurses who have similar occupational stress and long shift schedules. And so it's a moment where we have to think about how are we gonna be responsive and really embody that sort of environmental restorative justice that we were thinking about earlier. And so we're in the early design process, which is my favorite place to be. And so what have we done to help sort of support this process? So we've looked at literature around cancer epidemiology, gender disparities, occupational trauma and mental health. We've been able to start to an analyze just even the public data that's there around traffic and noise concerns and where do we wanna make sure their sleeping quarters are versus other sort of key concerns with homeless and others that are occupying that site simultaneously. 
we also are thinking about how do we just hear from as many of these different firefighters, especially as this is one of the first stations of about 10 to undergo changes? What do they want to see? And so what we were able to do was survey about 25% of a 450 person department, as well as sit down with a few female firefighters that they had and really get into some of these you know, decisions with them. And they have three, four, five kids, and yet they're still trying to be behind the wheel of the ladder until their pregnant but, you know, belly won't fit anymore. So these are people I have tremendous respect for and their voice has been incredible to be embedded in this work. And also just making sure that the design team is walking around these facilities with the staff and the firefighters and hearing from them what works, what doesn't, is actually also a really incredible opportunity to ensure that their health needs are being met. So I'm gonna give a quick snapshot of just what this looks like from a survey um, perspective. And I think it goes back to kind of what Tasha was saying, where it's, you know, there's also this presence of joy and camaraderie. And so what we see is there was kind of a couple of big takeaways. One was that you needed these large spaces for cooking and dining because this was a part of that sort of brotherhood, sisterhood, and sharing a meal together. And yet, simultaneously, these older facilities, even though it through specific interviews and talking to leadership, they said, oh, it's not as important for us to have private, quiet spaces. But really, I mean, when we talk to the, on an inter one-on-one -on -one level, that wanting private space, that wanting to be able to kind of remove themselves from the collective if they need to mourn, grieve, rest. And so this is just an opportunity to kind of understand what do we have and not have and how does that drive some of our responses. So just to wrap up, my feeling here is that, again, not only can we have health in every place, but we can think about it at every scale. And the fire chief spoke to us and said, well, okay, so you're, we're gonna have this one great firehouse. What about all my other firehouses? And this is where we as designers can kind of work together and identify what are some of these different opportunities that might change the way that people work, the policies, and bring that all together. It doesn't just have to be sort of a whole new physical building to ensure that we have better health for all. And so with that in mind, you know, for us, the design implications so far have been to focus on joy and not memorials. Their job is stressful enough that we need to celebrate that healing power of just being in that kitchen and make it the heart of the home, but also separating contaminants from people, protecting sleep from background noise and things that disrupt them, supporting efficient pathways for faster responses. These people are saving lives. And so making sure that the building is not adding wait time and stress, that's human health on the other side of this process, as well as creating space for privacy. And when we talk about female firefighters, when we talk about our firefighters of color, how are we also making it a truly inclusive place for them has been really an interesting challenge, but we're working on it. So that is what I have for all of you.